Hello and happy autumn and welcome to the Hospitality Maverick podcast with me, Michael Tinkser. We at Hospitality Mavericks are here to inspire leaders in the hospitality and restaurant industry to create heart-centered and profitable businesses from the inside out, the kind that both employees and customers love and support. In today's podcast, we're joined by a good friend and colleague, the Boy Bailey Speaks, aka Kieran Bailey restaurant coach and consultant and the co-founder of the great hospitality and restaurant network experience 101 i can only say if you've not been to one of the events get signed up for the next one in this episode i sat down with karen to talk about leadership the industry employee and customer experience and how to keep yourself on top of your game tune in if you dare to be different it gives me very, very great pleasure to introduce you to today's guest. Coming down all the way from Nottingham, I believe, get yes, a stop indeed. in London, to Brighton, to spend uh, not only a couple of hours on the podcast, but we already had a breakfast and a lot of talk about the industry. So please let me welcome the boy speaks Bailey, Kieran Bailey. Perfect. Was that a good intro? It was close. Close. Okay. The boy Bailey speaks. The boy Bailey speaks. Okay, yeah. Sorry. That's all right. Yeah. We're there, Brighton. What an amazing city. Thank you. Amazing city. And thank you very much for inviting me down uh, and taking time to show me around your amazing city. I get lost a lot, so it's always good to have somebody who knows it well. Yeah. Uh, we're not done yet. We're going to do a bit more after the little conversation here. Mm-hmm. Beautiful food, I think. Yeah, we have some different things lined up or options. So, yeah. I think we met on LinkedIn first and then we had a phone call and then we we set out to do this for a long time and then, you know, life got in the way and work and stuff like that. I think we really reconnected again when you launched your first experience one-on-one with Chris up in London. Absolutely. And you said, well, now we need to do it. And now we're here. And uh, I think there's a lot of people that have heard about you or seen you on LinkedIn and seen your small cool videos uh, where you talk a lot about customer service and Mm -hmm. and culture for that sake. But for people that don't know who you are and actually don't know your background, can you just give them the like the highlights of where you're from what you've done and where are you now it's all casual dining primarily and that's my absolute passion i love that kind of ability to be able to connect with guests really really quickly i started out in hotels and assistant manager up in the top end of scotland beautiful but i was very young it was very quiet i then came back moved into pubs and live venues spent five years running an amazing live venue where i got to do exactly as i pleased it was a world of freedom that was beautiful if i'm honest with you but having that level of freedom for quite that length of time becomes quite challenging when you think the world is moving into a branded environment so i had to try and work out really quickly could i do that could i work within the kind of the restraints of a brand rather than just kind of waking up in the morning and think i'm going to change the color of the wall i'm going to change the music on the jukebox the menu will be changed if i want to having that complete liberation and sense of freedom was going to be very difficult to come moving into a brand so i tried to went to go and work with costa coffee felt like a really sensible choice to kind of just work out is the brand thing going to work and actually yeah it made perfect Makes sense. I spent a year with those guys. I opened up a little site in a Waterstones, which encompassed two of my favourite things, coffee and books, which was lovely. And ended up opening up three sites for them in Nottingham. Got to the point where I realised, actually, brands work. Once you understand how to make a brand work for you, which is not getting caught up on the fact that there are constraints, but understanding that the, the framework that is there to kind of to guide you and protect you and to deliver for the customer and the guest, then you're on to an absolute winner. That level of freedom kind of carried through. So I then moved and I, I worked with Hard Rock Next, Hard Rock Cafe. That was a big moment for me, I think, because in my business, the pub that I ran, the venue that I ran, we were very customer centric. Everything was done with the customer in mind. If it wasn't solving a problem for the guest, it didn't get done. The kind of the experience was everything at that point. Hard Rock was the first time that actually I'd kind of from a corporate perspective, I felt that it could really work and that I got the true representation of that. And they really kind of, they connected with my own personal values in a big way. And I spent a couple of years working with those guys and then kind of moved along, spent five years with Wagamama, who were amazing. I was just in there on Tuesday night, actually, in Nottingham having dinner. I go there at least once a month still because... It's just fabulous, to be fair. Ironically, it took my wife six months to persuade me to eat there. I was quite English in my approach, and I was kind of like, why would I want to sit next to strangers? If I go to dinner, I go to dinner with you, my sweet, and nobody else. She persuaded me eventually, and then I was like, actually, this is amazing. It's really, really cool. So I spent five years working with them, and for them to keep me engaged for five years was very, very cool, because I get distracted after about two, and they understood that actually the easiest way to do that was to give me some interesting 
interesting challenges to face. Uh, I opened in, in Leicester. I then took on a site in Meadow Hall, which would opened with great fanfare. It was going to be amazing. But the location was horrendous and it just fell firmly on its backside really quickly. So I had to go and try and turn that around and make a bit of a difference. Then took on the site in Nottingham, which was my kind of pretty much, I guess you would call it my hometown. And running those three kind of was just fun. It was interesting. And the reason I was able to do that successfully was because people, developing people and growing people and having a constant pipeline was really, really key to my success there. Probably more importantly, key to Wagamama's success in the Midlands. I think I looked at it last year and when there were about 100 sites, 10 of their general managers started with me as team members and as head chefs and they just kind of progressed through. And that's a beautiful thing for me. I'm skipping to the why, but that's the why. Yeah. It's the people. It's always about the people. And having that been a moment to be able to impact them and develop and grow their lives and really put a, a positive impact on it is an amazing thing. So I spent five years with those guys. I then went and did a couple of years with Red Hot World Buffet, which was moving into the kind of the, the, the street food, food hall market side of things. It was huge. 26,000 square feet, team of 132, management team of around 14 or so, which really kind of changed the way I operated because, again, people are absolutely key to me and I always pride myself on being available to my team but when you've got 132 of them you can't do that with quite the same level of kind of frequency so I had to change my approach to kind of managing through my team and leading through my managers which was a, an interesting challenge for me but it was a lot of fun and then I just at the end of there I just kind of thought I'm getting old I've got the knees of a 90 year old so day-to-day -day operations I know that when I'm in it then I'm in it and I have to be in it and I'm going to be kind of getting down and dirty. So for me to just take a little step back and think, what am I going to do next? And that led to, to my consultancy, which I guess we kind of, when we first spoke, you talked about our first phone call and that was that phone call to me immediately said to me that you and I were going to be friends and that actually we understood and we connected because I think we were both really honest on that phone call mm. and my overwhelming memory of that I certainly walked away thinking people don't really talk with that level of honesty about the challenges that we face because it was hard setting up my own business and going away and saying right this is going to be me in my little pool of people I was known I was recognized but in the wider world who the hell's Kieran Bailey? Some people kind of got it, some people didn't. So that was probably where the evolution of the boy Bailey kind of really began. I'm a man who enjoys his own voice. So I figured video, voice, that's the future. That's where we need to be aiming for. So I put a video camera on everything. And if I have an opinion, if I have a thought, if I have an experience, whether it's good, bad or indifferent, I will share that impression. I will share that perspective. And I'd like to think about how either you could amplify that and take it to the next level. Or if it was a, a maybe not such a great experience, how do we make it better? And I share that with video. I share that with camera and I share it with the people actually in the business as well, which is really key, which then led through to where I find myself now. So I split my time now between the consultancy work and the training and facilitation, but also it led into Experience 101, which is my new little baby. You know, I'm working on that with my friend Chris and it's a passion that is going to be amazing. Yeah, and for people that haven't tried that, I can only say to you, uh, go and try it out. You will meet amazing people. And again, coming down to, I think, both our whys is it all starts with the people and getting that right. So Experience 101, just shortly, what is that all about? I guess it began with the desire to influence the guest experience through our people. If we are not delivering great experience to our teams, to our people in the business, then we don't stand a living chance of delivering it to our guests. It was born from there. It's about events. We've done two big events so far, just planning our next one in October now, October the 15th. It's going to be at the Tanner's Warehouse on Bermondsey Street. And it's going to be amazing. But Experience 101 is not just about the events, the big events. It's about the small roundtable conversations, uh, experience talks. So we get kind of 12 or so people from kind of senior positions in the industry to talk about the challenges that the industry is facing right now and really kind of think about right so zero to 90 is a challenge delivery how do we make that work for us best is a challenge recruitment and retention full stop is a challenge we're not saying we have the answers we're saying we're looking to build the rooms where the people with the answers will come from if i wanted to go to the next experience 101 where do i look out to, to sign up to this? I mean, I would certainly go to the website, experience101.co.uk. Join the website, subscribe to the website. We have a video platform where we document all of the speakers that we have at the events. It's we, amazing content, by the way. The joy of it is, is we... We have a lot of people in our industry who don't get to come to these events. General managers, junior managers, they don't have access. So the idea of filming it and putting out that content and sharing it just means that everybody gets to benefit from it. So go to the website, check it out. Go to all of our social. It is experience underscore 101. We built this business on social media. So that's where you will find us. That's where you will hear us talking most. We talked a bit about your why. You said I already talked about it, the people bit. Why is people so important in your view it's obvious for us but why is it that we start to have to look a bit more on the, the human side of business 
if we take it to perspective of where we are as an industry? I think the reality is we have to be able to connect with people as individuals. And if we can't do that, then undoubtedly we're going to fall short. And I think for me, it was born from my first work experience as a young boy. And the first man I worked for was intense, very, very intense. He liked to shout at people and make them feel bad about themselves. And at 15, even I was able to look at that and think, that is not productive. And that was not connecting with me in any way, shape or form. And as time goes by, you kind of realise that actually we get to employ some of the most interesting, challenging people out there and we bring them into our business. And the only way we ever get the very best out of them is by creating an environment where they get to be themselves and they get to shine. And if we don't do that, then you end up with a collection of automatons who just deliver run-of-the-mill average service. And I think if I want an experience that's memorable, the person who's delivering that experience is the thing that's really going to make it memorable. Food is key, absolutely. But the people who are delivering it, they've got to be empowered to be themselves. They've got to be empowered to deliver. And that's not about saying you must be something. So in Wagamama, it wasn't that you must have tattoos and dreadlocks. It was that actually you just be you. Finding the time to be able to do that and finding the place and the space to be able to do that, it brings joy. Yeah, and you're right. It's a, there's nothing that stands alone. I normally say it's the love for people, food and your customers that determines your success. Mm-hmm. And all the other things are just noise. If you're not excellent in that, it doesn't matter those three things. What I uh, also saw here when you said that you talked about the zero to 90 days yes. churn, if we talk about the industry, can you elaborate a bit what you, what you mean by that and where you see the challenge around this? I think we've all been in a position where we have junior managers being tasked with recruiting people through to the business and they're not really being given the skills to be able to do that. We're not being given the training to do that. They're being told to check out a CV, look for any kind of relevant hospitality experience and if they've got that, then yay, happy days. Then we'll give them a trial shift and put them on the floor and see how they do. That is not a recruitment process, but sadly that is the process that most people are operating on right now. And I think when you look at the zero to 90 days, it was driven by a conversation with uh, the guys at Harry. They were talking about some of the research that they've done and they kind of come to the conclusion that 55% of people who join the industry are leaving within that give zero to 90 kind of window. Now we throw a lot of money at an induction. If I take the people element away from it and I take away the desire to actually kind of give people a great introduction to our business rather than an induction, if I take that away and I say, well, let's just make it about money. Well, how much money are we investing in that induction process? When I was at Wagger, I guess I calculated it and we came to around three, three and a half thousand pounds. Sounds right, yeah. Bloody which is crazy. Business, yeah. It's absolutely crazy that we would just think we'll do that and then hope for the best. So zero to 90 is being driven by the fact that actually... Again, we don't have all the answers, you know, and the thing about experience and certainly experience talks is nobody starts off around those tables with the mindset that I know how to solve this problem. What we do is we try to bring a collection of people together who've got different perspectives, different kind of versions of what the answer looks like, and certainly kind of looking at the challenge from a different kind of filter, if we can do that and we can open up that space and get them to speak freely, which, you know, when we have those conversations, we very clearly kind of stay sort of Chatham House rules. So everything we talk about, it stays within the room. So whilst we document everything that we do, you know, we take video of all sorts and there's meetings that we're we're sitting in, we're documenting and sharing. For that one, we don't do it. You know, they kind of we do a little bit of filming at the beginning, have some ask some questions, get some kind of insight from the people who are attending, and then the cameras go off. And then everybody gets to speak freely. And the thing about it is, is everybody is having the same challenge. Again, it comes back to that honesty in the conversations. Do we want people who are just not recognised and are not comfortable to say that, yes, of course, I'm feeling the same pain that you're feeling? Or do we want those folks who are just going to try and persuade themselves? No, no, everything's good for us. I want the people who are open. I want the people who understand that actually my pain is your pain. And if I solve it for you, then you know what? I'm going to solve it for me. There are a lot of people in our industry, and I've spent a lot of this year saying that 2019 is a year of collaboration. I began that with, it was probably more of a hope, if I'm honest with you, when we started to talk like this. But actually, as time has gone by, people have proven that absolutely, yes, it is the year of collaboration. And it is the kind of, it's the inception point for this as being the way that we work moving forward. Zero to 90 is a problem we don't fix overnight. And it's a problem that is bad for the industry. It's a problem that causes us challenges. There are some fixes that we can put into place, as I say. Take away the idea of an induction where we give somebody a little manual and we sit them down. And if they're lucky, we give them a buddy to work with. If they're very lucky, take that away and think, right, well, actually, how do I involve somebody in my business? How do I make them become an ambassador? How do I kind of get to them 
as an individual. And it starts off with the recruitment. You know, it starts off with actually kind of the CV in any recruitment actually really in my mind isn't particularly relevant. I honestly don't care. I want to know about you as an individual. I want to know about what makes you smile. One of the first questions I, I will ask anybody is, tell me about the last time you had an experience that really rocked you, that really kind of stuck with you and made you think, damn, that was good. And everybody should be able to do that. Everybody. If we're in this industry and we're not going out and trying different things, then we're doing something wrong. Everybody can kind of go to that point. And then you see that reaction, that moment where they kind of start to smile and it's like, that's the point. So that moment when you start to tell that story and you start to smile because you're going back to that feeling and feeling is everything. I guess maybe that's 2019 and very kind of kind yeah. of being upfront and being close to our feelings. And not everybody, again, is, is happy with that and comfortable with it. But the feeling is absolutely everything. So that moment when they kind of go back to that and they start to smile and you can see they're going back to that wonderful moment where something just different happened and it may be something huge and it may be something tiny. That is a beautiful thing. So I want them to think about that and then I want them to think about an experience where they walked away thinking, God, that was terrible. I never want to be near that again. I don't ever want that to be part of my life. Because again, we've all had those experiences and if we look at the high street potentially right now, there's maybe more of those experiences kicking around than there is the kind of truly exceptional ones. So being able to recognize what the good one does and how it makes us feel and the, the smile that it brings to our face. But then straight away, going back to that negative one that was just where you felt disregarded, where you felt no one actually cared, where you felt that no one was invested in your happiness at that moment. You can go to that and you can connect with how that made you feel, but then it becomes really easy to say, how do I avoid that for my guests walking through my door? If we can get to that point, then our team become unstoppable. So what you're saying is that don't look at it as an employee journey or process. It's actually an employee experience you need to create from day one. So they have that small moment of feeling very special in their new job and thereby you potentially can crack. I guess everybody, even though you share your learnings in a room like that, everybody has to go and do their thing. Absolutely. There's not one blueprint to solve all problems. There is you not. You need to adapt. Every culture needs different things and so on. From those conversations, what is like the three core issues you see these conversations go around? Because there's a lot, you know, challenges around not enough talent. Let's talk about talent crisis in mm -hmm. the moment. They, they've talked about, you know, Brexit and so on. What are, you know, when we really get honest, what are the three main issues for our industry when it comes to this turnover it's funny really because if you ask folks the initial thing they will jump to is the talent shortage and i kind of think that's an actually an easy answer to go to i think that's the easy response as soon as you start to dig under a little bit it kind of comes down to how are we attracting those people into our business so when every single guest that walks through the door is potentially an employee for you potentially you know personally my best members of my teams have come through with people who've actually loved what we do Stop talking about the talent shortage, you know, because it becomes a really easy excuse and start looking at the pool and thinking, right, where do I need to look? You know, there's a lot of options out there. Look at the work that Greg at Only A Payment Away is doing. You look at the work that the guys at Clink are doing. There are a lot of people out there who are marginalized from society that we look at and think, hmm, are you really the right people for us? Because, well, maybe they've got that criminal record. So I think drop the idea that there's no talent and start thinking, do I need to look in different places for my talent? is the starting point, I think. From talking to the people around the tables, for them, it is the training of the management teams within the business to be able to identify the talent, and more importantly, identify the culture fit. So for me, I guess, when it comes to recruitment, it's character, culture, and chemistry. I'm looking for those three things. Technical skill set, you can teach anybody to do anything, really. As long as they've got the right mindset and the right will to the, the want to learn, then that's fine. But if they don't have the right character, if they don't have the right kind of attitude, they're not going to fit in. If they don't understand the culture and they don't buy in to the culture, then they just become grit in the works. And if the chemistry within the rest of the team, they could be the best person technically at their job. And there are, I've come across some folks who are incredible at what they do, but from a chemistry perspective, they just become grit and then the thing, thing just seizes up. So I think it is about, yes, the talent shortage is the first thing, but actually, how do we look at where are we finding it? What does the recruitment look like? What's the strategy for it? Or is it just, let's take a big pile of CVs and hope for the best? But then it does come down to the induction. And it comes down to what does that actually look like? Are you bringing that person in? Are you giving them the chance to be an ambassador for your business? In a lot of cases, it's not. It is just at best. We give them a manual and away they go and they tick all their boxes and they fill it in and we sign them off and say happy days. But actually, it needs to be more than that. So are we talking to millennials and Gen Z in a way that actually works for them? Or are we talking to them in a way that works for us and the way that we think has worked for us in the past? So I think that's probably one of the other biggest challenges is how do we connect with those people? Because I am a long way from Gen Z. I'm a distance from a millennial, if I'm entirely honest with you. 
you. So the only way I can really work out how to get the best and how to communicate with them is by throwing myself in the middle and saying, what works for you? And being open to the fact that what I'm doing right now, it may have worked for me historically, but it's not going to work for me going forward. And there are a lot of people out there who are doing some really good work about how you engage with folks. And, you know, we have to understand that attention spans are shorter. That's part of the deal. I was chatting with one of the guys from Hard Rock and obviously they opened up in Piccadilly recently. And Debbie was talking and she kind of suggested that even the application process that you and I would think back to when we were younger, it's so different. They're not going through that application process. They don't want to fill out a three page document with their life history. Honestly, I don't want to do that. I, do, I think of the times when I've had to do that over and over again. I think I'm a busy boy. Time is of the essence for most people. So recognizing the fact that that's a challenge for them and thinking, actually, we need to change the process. And Debbie talked about the fact that she would just have people turn up and going, so we're just we're just going to get stuck in. Should we just do this? It's like, oh, well, you've got to fill this paperwork in. Yeah, mm, don't ever want to do that. It seems like hard work. So are we talking to them in a way that makes sense to them? Are we using technology in a way that actually kind of brings them in and engages with them and makes them smile and makes them think that, yes, these people understand us? Or are we still kind of saying, here's your three-page application, fill that in, and then we'll go from there? I agree on all the things you put there. And are we looking out of the window or are we looking in the mirror from a leadership perspective? It's a concept from Jim Collins, and he talks about the, the most successful leaders through history has the ability always to look in the mirror and be the most critical on themselves and actually trying to understand what they may wrong. And the, the, the ones that is more the more charismatic leader and the tyrant would look out the window and say there's something wrong with the world. It's not working and mm-hmm. it's somebody else's fault. We have a talent shortage that will be looking out the window. Absolutely. And as I think, we don't have a talent crisis. As you say, we just need to start looking differently on what talent is and mm-hmm. how we actually get that potential out in people. We actually start to need to go from being bosses to coaches. So we don't have a talent crisis. We have a leadership crisis in my view in the industry. It's not because we don't do well, we just need to lead in a different way because the world has changed. So the world wants something else. And therefore, it, it demands something else. Yeah, yeah, it demands something else. It's happening if you want it or not. And we can't keep on running businesses and that goes outside the hospitality industry as well, like we did in the industrial age. We're still caught up in organizations about managing in the same way we did in the industrial age, very top down, even though we say we're very open and, and all these things. But there needs to be something that really makes these people think that your culture is different. And I think it starts with that many forget they need to tell stories because there's so many great mm. stories in many companies, but nobody tells them. Mm. What is the purpose? Why are we here? Why is uh, this a special place to join? Uh, you talked about some stories about why Wakamamas and Hard Rock when you joined them in the early days. It sounded like there were some special stories going Absolutely. on. And we join stories. That's what we do as people. We we emotionally connect with them. So we need to find back to the why we're here originally. And that's that's how we start with many of our clients. It's like, what is your story? And we're not talking from a brand marketing point of view. That's mm-hmm. a different thing. Of course, that needs to work. But we're talking about what deeply, why are we here? Why are we a restaurant? And why are we actually meant to be serving people? Why are we making a difference? And what are you going to be contributing? to in that journey and that's what has to be told in the beginning as well as the very good basic training so that's one of my beliefs I totally agree with you but I think it comes deep down from things will change when we as leadership teams including myself start to think about doing things differently there to be different as I normally call it. Not one of us is the finished article, are we? Let's nope. be honest with you. Yeah. It's it's perpetual and it's constantly looking for kind of for, for growth and evolution. I guess the thing I always say is I'm a, I'm a 45 year old man. There's probably going to be no wholesale revolutions in me as an individual right now. I'm probably kind of somewhere close. However, there are going to be some small evolutions and everything that I read, every podcast that I listen to, every voice that I hear, I'm looking and thinking, what can I take from that? How can that impact me? How can it change the way I operate going forward? Because again, it would be really easy to look and say, I've been really successful in the past at kind of developing people and growing people and keeping those consistent kind of talent pipelines moving forward and just sit on those little laurels and think yes I've I've achieved but that's not going to work going forward because as I say those methods were maybe five years ago 10 years ago 15 years ago the world requires change so and as I said I think it demands it so we have to be open to that idea and I love that kind of idea that actually understanding kind of why you're here what is your purpose and I, I'll always go back to when I'm training managers to kind of to interview and to get best out of that process I want them to be ready to answer that question. I want them to have really thought about their why. The brand why is key, it's important, we need to be able to share that. But if somebody is sitting in an interview and says, well, tell me why you do what you do, tell me why you're here, and tell me how does it make your life better. If that person couldn't answer that, certainly in about sort of a minute and a half, then they haven't given enough consideration. Mm. And we need to, we need to be prepared. Yeah. So we talked about the people aspect here, and uh, I totally agree. I think one of the things that's been lost, though, was 
like come from my back in my career McDonald's were really good at as well was building the pipeline of great people mm -hmm. having them ready as people move on and accepting that you know we live in a world where nobody stays in a job forever so start accepting yeah maybe they're going to be one and two years there. so why don't you get the most out of it why Absolutely. don't you don't boost that potential to the most insane so you get return of investment on your bottom line you only do that when you leverage people's competencies not making them work harder but actually make them grow and develop and that made me even make them say I'm going to stay a year more because what I get here is very special Absolutely. I actually grow here I, I think I'm going to stay a year more so every time you win a year or three months you have a massive success in my world but it has to be that focus on this pipeline and you do only borrow them. You, you don't own anyone. I've met so that. many people that think they own people. You don't own them. You borrow them for a period of time. So get the best out of that and be ready. They will maybe leave tomorrow. But if you've done your best, you can look in the mirror and say, I didn't do my best, but I just have to do better next time. I love that. Yeah. It comes back to that idea. Somebody said to me, if I'm looking for new team members in my business, I will go and take a look around and see who around me is doing well. And somebody said, oh, do you not feel bad about stealing people? And I say, stealing people? How can I steal people? I don't, those people don't belong to me they don't belong to the next person mm -hmm. we are custodians for them you know and hopefully if we're good custodians and we're good curators of their experience then they will have no interest in listening to me and listen to my persuasive talk of why they should come and be part of my team mm -hmm. because they're having a good experience there for themselves yeah we can't steal people it's an absurd idea yeah. it's funny I, I was delivering a leadership session last week and we were talking about kind of the simple thing of delegation and why do people do and don't delegate and one of the guys uh, who, was, who was chatting there and, and these are these a small group so we work in kind of groups of around six people so we can really kind of get into kind of what they're doing on their daily basis and how it works for them and one of the chaps was like well if I start to delegate then they'll start to know more and they'll potentially they'll know more than me and then what happens if they become better than me and I said well then you my friend have done your job because every single person that comes through your business your goal should be very simple it's to make sure that they are better than you or one day they will be and then if you've got that in your mindset what that does for you is that encourages you to keep thinking right self-development now got to put this into work and I do kind of think that one of the challenges that we have in certainly in, in the hospitality industry is I don't think as managers and as leaders we're encouraged necessarily to work too hard on our self-development. I've worked for some big businesses. There wasn't always a huge amount of time and effort and money being given to the development of the managers coming through. The toughest steps that I think that people take is to get from general manager of a single site to multi-site manager, area manager, because it requires a whole different type of thinking. You're leading through managers suddenly, as you mentioned before. Exactly. It's a different skill set. Exactly. So everything and I think you learned, you throw out of the window in one day. That's it. Yeah. And that's a really uncomfortable thing to say to somebody, to say, I've, you know, I've spent the last 10 years working towards this and now I've got to just pop that in a little basket and leave it and never think about it again. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, absolutely you do. You know, you've got to be open to that idea. But businesses have a responsibility to their people to say, well, actually, I'm going to develop you towards understanding that rather than on that first day of saying, right, now you have to behave differently. Yeah. That makes no sense to me. I don't want that surprise. I want to be aware of what's coming my way. Yeah. I want to be comfortable with what's coming my way. So I'm not kind of, oh, hang on a second, got to change the way that I work. No, no, no. That can't be. So I do think that kind of certainly within hospitality, we need to work harder on developing our people. We need to work harder on looking at those leadership skills and looking at how we move them forward, you know, and kind of helping them to understand actually. So what is your motivation? Do you want to go and become an area manager? For a long time, I thought I wanted to be an area manager. And then actually I kind of realized what a terrible idea. I don't like paperwork. I don't like ticking boxes. I don't like measuring KPIs. I find it utterly boring, if I'm entirely honest with you. Mm. I like being in the middle of things. I like the energy, the kind of the frenetic kind of noise of what's going on around us. I don't like just sitting at a computer and thinking, well, this Excel spreadsheet tells me I need to do X, Y, and Z now. And maybe I need to go and do this amount of side visits. Or well, maybe we have to find that role wrong. For That's sure. my question. For sure. Because I guess you are a people leader. Suddenly, You are a storyteller. You are the extension of the culture, in my view. Mm -hmm. We work with a couple of restaurant groups, smaller ones, and they're in this growing phase. And we work with from, from the purpose first and uh, people first. And actually, the journey we take them on, and especially I can see, because the best GM often transit into the ops director, of course. ops manager role. And, and what we found out is that you have a unique opportunity to define that role. I'm actually doing a session later today where we're going to define the new ops role for business, ops director role, ops manager role. And it's not about what you just said, the spreadsheet, mm -hmm. because you, suddenly you are in the job of developing leaders. And managers, if they continue being a manager, they're actually only developing employees. But mm -hmm. you have to develop leaders, and leaders develop leaders. And that's where the real ability to be a leader is shown. And not many are trained in doing that. And that comes back to what you said with self-development. So when we do a leadership program with an organization, we'll say, start with leading yourself. That's the first step. Yep. 
self-development, talk about everything from what you eat to how you think, your mindset. And then it goes to leading others, which is people skill, delegation, mm-hmm. you know, feedback models. And then it's leading the organization because that's also a different skill set. It's a communication skill set. I think it's, as you said, there's just a lack in investment in making them you know, grow and actually be successful. They actually, it's a, a totally gamble. I normally say to some CEO, you can just go to casino and take your 60,000 pound salary and throw it on the table. Mm-hmm. You're doing the same with your business. Because you're not making that the opportunity for that person to succeed. You're making that zero. This is a massive step mm-hmm. for people to say. So, yeah, totally agree on that. I can see that's a massive issue. And it carries across with industry. I mean, I, I do a lot of work with a truck business, and it's the same thing. So you kind of you think, do the best general managers necessarily make the best area managers? Possibly not. Will they make the best directors, the best MDs? Possibly not. In the same way that with this truck business, when they're looking for a supervisor or a workshop controller to take responsibility of a team, well, the person who naturally gets that is the best best technician. You could be an amazing technician, but you could be a horrible, horrible leader of people. And if I'm honest with you, I've met some amazing leaders of people within that business. And I've met some folks where I just think you are in the wrong job, my friend, because actually you don't enjoy leading people. You've got to enjoy that responsibility because it's a huge responsibility. And I think you've got to be ready to embrace that and say, I'm going to take that on board and I'm ready for the weight of that. It doesn't always happen. No, I think it's very interesting when people become leaders. What I found out at some point, I need to talk with them about their life have changed suddenly. They are suddenly not receivers they are servants mm-hmm. they need to make other look brilliant before themselves so they can't expect to get anything before they've done that job when you do that you're going to get a lot so it's about give 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 and get that's what leadership is about it sounds very simple but it, it demands some you know really persistent to do i think that's where many fail the thing when they put on their shirt i normally say you put on the uniform the new uniform that maybe looks a little bit different than the others then you're done and i've especially <laughs> seen that when people goes up to gm as well then yep. they think it's done now i've done it no you know even started you're 10 points behind because people just in that you become the boss there's probably 50 percent that don't think you are deserving that role right mm-hmm. now and you need to earn your your right in a way in your stripes simon sinek has a book to call the leaders that eat last and in that he has an analogy about when they go and have lunch or dinner in the canteen the leaders are the last one putting food on their trays mm-hmm. you feed your soldiers first of course and i think if you start thinking of that as a leader you will win a lot just having that thought pattern that filter when you make decision as a leader and your success will be easier just thinking about things in that way it'll definitely have a huge impact and I think you're right the kind of the military has some really amazing examples I was reading that David Marquette yeah. the submarine commander turn around the ship yeah beautiful book yeah leadership by intent yeah such a simple thing again where you look at it and think well actually when you explain that it's just common sense do I want 135 people under the control of one brain or do I want 135 brains actively actively contributing to the success and the development of my business well common sense is I want the 135 five brains pushing forward active brains exactly that and I guess you come back to that recruitment thing of if you've got the right people on board Jim Sullivan and he's kind of uh, have you got people in the right the right people on the boat or on, on the bus well sometimes you have to have those tough conversations I think it's time to make some changes yeah yeah, and he borrowed it uh, from my favorite book, Jim Collins. I went to university and I wrote my dissertation on the organization I was growing. And mm-hmm. it was, we found, I found out on that journey, I had a lot of wrong people on the bus. And I had to make some really tough changes because it meant I need to work harder and go out and find new people. But actually, six months later, when I'd done that, I had an amazing business and people actually wanted to be part of the culture. And they were not maybe the most skillful, but they definitely wanted to be part of it. And that's much easier than having the wrong people on the bus. That makes trouble. You're right as well. It, it's it's harder when you do that. I mean, life gets tougher. There's no getting around it at all. If you ask anybody who's worked with me, I have a, a million kind of little sayings. And one of them was, we deal with the short-term pain because we know the long-term gain will be worth it. Mm. So if the right people are on board, the right people are invested, the right people have kind of submerged themselves in the culture that you're trying to create, they will absolutely say, I'll take that short-term pain. They will say, let's get the right people on board. So if we've got some people who are problematic for the business, who are that little kind of toxic terrorist who just is trying to bring it down and kind of slow everything down, we should remove them in an effective way and in a correct way and give people the best chance possible. But we've all had those terrorists in our business where you think there's nothing I'm actually ever going to do for you that's going to turn you around because you actually just don't like what we're doing. And that's fair. That's fine. You know, it's kind of you can't be everybody's cup of tea and you've got to be okay with that. So being able to recognize those little toxic terrorists and say, well, this is not the place for you. You actually want to be what I call a Marmite culture. Yes. You want to attract the right people that actually fits with your culture. I don't know if you've ever heard about Sabah Support by Amazon Mm -hmm. Shoe Company. And I think they, they pay people to leave. Yes. We give you $7,000 if you just leave, if you don't like it. So they actually give people the incentive to leave. That's better business than ha- having the wrong people stay for a longer time. I was reading about Brewdog, 
Brew Dog does a similar thing. Yeah. In the first couple of weeks, you start your introduction to the business. If there's a kind of a look that says, we, we don't think this is going to work, then they'll pay you to walk away. Yeah. It's the right thing to do. That investment up front and saying, well, do I pay, I don't know, a few hundred pounds? Do I pay a thousand pounds for you to leave? Depending on the role, I guess. Actually, is it worthwhile? Yes, because if I don't, then I keep going and I keep persisting and I hope that I turn you around and hope is never a strategy that any success has ever been born from. There's no getting around that at all. So do I have to make a sensible choice and say, actually, this is just honest conversation. This clearly isn't working. This is why it's not working from our perspective. How do you find it? How are you feeling? And the honest answer is if most most people will be able to look and yeah, think nine out of ten yeah. they know self-awareness is there are degrees of it but in that point when you start a new role you know really quickly i can think of a job that i did where i worked with one brand and on the first day of starting my kind of induction to the business i did a little walk around and counted kind of fridges and freezers and the number of fridges was kind of on my two fingers and i needed two hands for the freezers and on that first day i was thinking this is a terrible place for me to be and at that moment i should have actually just said no I've made a poor choice. I'm going to call it quits now and go and do something else. And we've all done that. And you need to have these experience to know. Absolutely. And, but then you need to take it into your decision-making framework as you go forward. There's one interesting thing you said, because we talked a bit about this, you know, we have a challenge around, you know, how do we make them real leaders? I think it's breeds from the top as well that, that we think there's a short term to great leadership but it's not it's like there's a long journey and you really need to invest and I often think it comes from also making top management let the organization do what it needs to do and have trust and they're going to do it mm -hmm. if you give them you know the right purpose and direction to follow of the business make sure that you want your most important job as you as CEO or founder or MD or whatever senior role you have is to get the right people on the bus the wrong people off the bus start building a culture investing in having the right training and so on and then get out of the way because I see so many times that management high up in the hierarchy don't get out of the way. We all try to be in that situation where you feel confident and you have the ability to do a great job, but they're not getting out of the way. They're not giving you the time. They're not giving you the, the resources to get the job done. You just they're putting on necessary demands on you and that's where you leave and, and I think there's many they try to take control because they think they need to take control that I'm hired to take control you're hired to facilitate mm -hmm. a very special environment if we talk from a CEO founder level of a business I think it's tough sometimes especially for founders when it's their baby yeah I think so I think, and I understand that. I understand the dilemma, but I can see that's one of the reasons why we, we don't actually get that leadership cultivated down because we don't let people be leaders in a way. I think part of the challenge there is it's comfortable, for, certainly from a founder's perspective, it's comfortable to kind of to be in the middle. It's comfortable to be controlling everything and to have everything run through you rather than kind of just stepping back and thinking, right, okay, my business is at a point now where I found some really smart, intelligent people, some passionate people who want to take it forward. Now I'm going to step back and focus on kind of the bigger picture element of what I should be looking at rather than looking at every single little bit of my new shine every little detail bring those people in to focus on that as you say step out of the way let them do their thing constant coaching guidance absolutely that's always going to be there keeping those conversations flowing always be available to give them a little bit of guidance and direction and and, and kind of give them a little bit of, of your kind of value again and kind of constantly keep that 50p going into the meter but just let them come to you when they need to is really the key element of now. Oh, something I picked up before, you talked a bit about seeing people's potential as well. And I think there's a lot about as well that often we look at their downsides mm -hmm. as leaders instead of understanding if we actually focus on their strengths and how we bring that to life in a role. We actually think about that before we put them in the job. Where the, the challenge is right now in the life cycle, would they actually thrive dealing with it? Because it took me some time finding out who do I, do I use as turnaround and opening manager. I quickly find out I was probably a people person down the line. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, when I just want, you know, that business works, I want to run it consistently. I keep called it the hardcore ops person, the excellence person, the polisher, I mm -hmm. call them. Often I think it's just being aware where you actually put people because you can kill talent as well. You can have amazing talent. You just kill by putting in the wrong challenge. Mm. I just need to get firefighting. I just need to put a person there. He's always done well or she's always done well. I'm just going to put them in that situation. You actually drown them and then you don't think, why did it leave me? I gave them a pay raise. I gave them a new challenge. But maybe you actually didn't put them in a challenge that gave them energy. You maybe sat them. Absolutely. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. There's a, a really good example of that for me is when I, when I was with Red Hot, one of my uh, former chefs from Hard Rock came to me and he was having a tough time. 
and he'd achieved a tremendous amount as a kitchen manager. He had excelled, to be fair, it was extraordinary. But there had been a moment where something had gone wrong. I won't go into detail, but it was a simple thing that went wrong that actually it was handled badly by the business that he was working with. But it completely destroyed his kind of spirit, basically. He'd gone from being this outrageous, kind of like really enthusiastic, positive person to just being physically, when you looked at him, you could just see the way he carried himself. He was broken down and this, this whole experience had really kind of nailed him to the floor. And I was like, this is not good. This is not the man that kind of I know you are. So I brought him into my business and said, come on, let's do something different different so maybe step away from the kitchen for a little bit and come in front of house and he was like I don't know nothing about front of house I was like well do you not though so when you're in the kitchen how many times were you out on the restaurant floor well quite a lot and how many times were you giving coaching and guidance to the serving team about the information need to be given to the guests when they're taking that food out and kind of what stories are they going to be sharing about that dish and he was like well yeah that's part of the job isn't it exactly it's part of that so we brought him out and put him in front of house and it was uncomfortable for him for a little while but actually he kind of understood really quickly that that was actually his place that was his happy place because he liked to be in amongst things he liked to be in amongst the guests and he liked to be given that opportunity to really kind of make people smile but then he also got the chance to really coach and affect the futures and the careers of around 30 different people at that point which for him well that's now his life so he's now kind of taken a step away from again restaurant operations and he's setting up a business as a feedback coach which is amazing it's absolutely extraordinary and I think back to kind of when I found him when he came back to my door sort of five years ago there is no way that wouldn't have been anywhere near his thinking he was broken five years down the line I haven't actually given him the right challenge. I guess it comes down to, do I look at the chef? Do I look at the server? Do I look at the manager? Do I look at the pot washer? Or do I look at what they potentially can be? Do I look at the individual about what makes them smile? What drives them? For me, it was really obvious what made him smile and what drove him. And it was people again. It was kind of moving people forward. So putting him into a situation where he was able to really do that on a daily basis, it's now put him on the path to his second career, which he's doing amazingly well at. And he's building it and he's growing it and he's going out there and he's kind of, he's getting comfortable with kind of sharing himself but he's also having a positive impact on a wider kind of network and again he's using social media in a massive way and really kind of sharing it and he's built up a huge following over on LinkedIn Raf the feedback coach check him out he's amazing yeah, yeah, I thought it was him there are people in our lives that we meet that will always be a part of our lives hospitality is a family that we choose yeah. that's it you know I kind of I, have, I come from a big family I'm the youngest of six children three of my brothers I have nothing to do with at all they're just it's gone my twin brother and my sister we're all very close this year was tough for us our mum died in February so that was hard and that's the family that was given to me but the family that I've chosen is the family that's really helped me and supported me all the way through this because in that situation I had to be the kind of I had to be the strong one I had to be the one to kind of hold it together I had to be the order I'm the youngest I'm the baby of the family is the gist of it and they all laugh at me for this that I'm the little baby because well <laughs> I don't look like a little baby but my mum always said hey, he's my little baby boy for them I had to be strong I had to be kind of I had to take control of the situation I had to plan the, the funeral the process Process, clearing out the house and kind of just tying up my mum's life basically and that was hard my family needed that so I had to be that for them I had to be kind of untouchable I had to be unstoppable I had to be kind of I've got this you grieve you do what you do and I will just work through this I'll get this done and I'll find my time eventually my hospitality family they're the one who's actually came to me and they're the ones who supported me because I didn't have to be strong at that point for them I'd done that in the past I'd, I'd built the emotional bank account up with them as our American friends would say and I've, I'd done that all day long so the support that I needed at that point came from the family that I chose. And I love that of our industry. It's a beautiful thing. And I think we've all got that responsibility to each other. Yeah, and I think that's one of the strengths of it when you come to see compassion. It's quite high when you get to the core of the honesty in the industry. Which uh, I think we just have to remember we don't forget the compassion in our day-to-day -day running the businesses. Because that's another, in my world, uh, the compassion is a difficult word. It's like, oh, what do we talk about? Dalai Lama here. But we're actually just talking about being kind. Yeah, know? that's it. Care about other people than just Again, your spreadsheet. Hard. It shouldn't be hard. But it, there's definitely some challenges sometimes. Because sometimes people, they actually forget this humans they're dealing with in the day-to-day -day life. And they all have feelings. They all have challenges. One of my biggest learning was that I had a boss at some time. He was an incredible guy. He said to me, Michael, what? life do you think because I was quite frustrated with a couple of people like anyone you know I probably pushed them too hard as well I've been mean, not happy they could feel and I, then my boss at that point he was the ops director for the group he came around and he said to me what life do you think they go home to what challenge do you think they have and I suddenly found out I didn't know I really didn't know they were just coming here working and mm -hmm. that was you know John and that was Lucy but I really didn't know maybe actually I need to find out really to be able to manage them I was like and that was my early 20s you know because yep. I was all about you know we just need to get stuff done let's get the job done yeah, that's what we done. do it does one of those moments where you think like try to understand others before you want to get your things across it's then vital have, it's vital as a, as a leader as well you talk a lot about the guest experience and mm. now we're talking a lot about the internal leadership how do you create great 
guest experience? What is the the core in that? We talked about selecting the right people, Mm -hmm. have the right culture. Are there any other things if you want to create an amazing guest experience? I think it all comes down to empowering the people within your business to take control and giving them the opportunity to just go for it. And sometimes accepting the fact that every now and again, they're going to get it wrong and they're going to make a mistake. But more often than not, if you've trained them well, if you've kind of put them on the right track, then they will absolutely smash it out of the park. I see lots of examples of that. A couple of weeks ago, well, a couple of months ago now, I guess, I was up in Liverpool mm. and I was at Wreckfish Bistro. And Amazing place. I, I mean, elite bistros. I, if you could replicate what Gary Osher does up there, kind of yeah. with his team, the kind of the culture that he has created is extraordinary. Yeah. And Wreckfish is a great example. So I'm, I'm a lone diner a lot. I, I travel up and down the country a lot throughout the week and I sit by myself and I'm on my own business. And I'm really comfortable with that. And I was watching what was happening in the restaurant because it just, again, it makes me smile. Obviously, you see an open kitchen. It's nice to be able to really kind of see what's going on. And I saw the chef and I didn't know what his role was because again, there's no kind of clear hierarchy in their kitchen. It's just every chef looks the same, dresses the same. There's no pretty colored hat. There's no name badge. It is just, we are chefs. This is what we do. And the chef put this food up on the pass and the dish looked amazing. It's beautiful. And as he was finishing off, just kind of preparing it and just clearing it and making sure it was perfect, he just called for service. And as he looked around, the waiting staff, they were dealing with guests. They were busy. Now, I have seen so many situations where a chef would just raise his voice a little louder and shout service at a little bit more intensity and then get irritated when nobody is there within the next three seconds. This chef didn't even consider that as an option. He asked for service once. He acknowledged the fact that his team were working and were dealing with guests, came out from behind the kitchen, picked up the dish, took it to the guest, stood and spoke for a minute or so, gave him a bit of information about the dish and delivered it. And now there's a couple of things there. He's driven by making sure that his food is served at the most optimum moment. He doesn't want the quality to suffer, but it's driven by the respect of the fact that his team were working with guests. They, were, they weren't just loitering. There was nobody on their mobile phone. There was nobody kind of just hanging around chit-chatting. These people were actually adding value to guests at that point. That's probably one of the easiest and some simple examples of actually how you deliver guest experience. You care more about the guest than you care about kind of yourself a little bit. He was the head chef, as it turns out, because again, it kind of... It, okay. Is that a great example there? It's a beautiful example. I had no idea who was the head chef. I was just like, boom, chef, love that, amazing, took a photo, put it out there on Twitter. I was like, this is absolutely top draw, that is service. And again, being me, I then go to my hotel and I sit and make a little video and I talk about kind of how that made me feel. And it was nothing to do with me. He wasn't bringing food to my table. He wasn't engaging with me at all, but it made me feel. And so I sit and talk about that and I share it. And then Gary Osher kind of comes and says, you know, that's my head chef. And there's a moment where he's like, you could see that he's just like, so, so proud. Yeah. And culturally within his business, that's what he's built. And that's what we need to be aiming for. We need to be aiming for a collection of people who care more about the guests than they care about their own egos. Mm. And if we do that, then I think we win every single time. And they're not going to get it right every time, obviously. No. It's not going to be perfect. But if our intent is always good and our intent is to make sure that every person who walks through the door has an amazing time, then more often than not, we are going to get it absolutely correct. And if every person in the team and every link in the chain, and I always kind of go back to when I was a little boy, we used to have a program called Blue Peter. I don't even know if it's still on. And they would do Guinness Book of World Records attempts. I always enjoyed the ones where they would set up dominoes and they'd set up like 50,000 dominoes. And there's a moment where Norris McWhirter has dragged his backside out of bed and he's come to kind of test them and see if they do it. And they would flick. And you'd see 15, 16,000 dominoes drop perfectly in unison, doing each and every one doing its thing. And then it would stop because one domino was just out of position. It was to the left. It was slightly to the right. It was not in its place. At that point, you've got 34,000 dominoes standing there waiting, waiting to do what they were destined to do, but not being able to fulfill their destiny because that one was out of action. That's what we do in restaurants. That's what we do in hospitality. For us, making sure that everybody is in place, everybody knows their responsibility. And it's very simple. Our responsibility is to make sure that every guest leaves the door, not thinking if I come back, but thinking when I come back. That's it. And if we can get into their heads to that degree, we win. on. I totally agree. On this journey you've been on, you mentioned a couple of books, David Marquez, you one of my favorite books as well. But who who is uh, your hero? Who keeps you going? Because setting up your own business and keep going sometimes can be quite tough. And you just have to be honest with yourself all the time because yes, you need to make a living out of it as well. But you, where you get your inspiration from, we all get some kind of light from somewhere to keep us going sometimes. I guess it varies. I read a lot and like I say, I listen to a lot of podcasts. I spend a lot of time in the car to be fair. So it makes perfect sense. It's a good use of my time. It certainly kickstarted from my family and from my background there. Tough environment life wasn't easy my mum brought six kids up pretty much by herself for a long time she was a massive element of that for me you know she kind of she sticks with me every single day of the week and I think about kind of what I'm doing I think could I explain it to my mum would she understand my choices if the answer is no 
then I'm doing it wrong. I, I need to be able to explain it to her. And to be fair, she's a very intelligent woman, not particularly well educated, but very, very intelligent and had an, a tremendous ability to just call me out on my vagaries. And so every now and again, she'd be like, I don't know what you're trying to tell me, Kieran. Cut to the chase. And if I couldn't help her to explain what I was doing, then I was doing something wrong and I haven't considered it enough. So she was massive for me. And, you know, as I said, you know, she's gone now. It's sitting on the desk in front of me as a little coin. Yeah, that I was just... almost asking you before, what is the coin about? That is my mum's tremendous sense of humour. My mum loved the royal family. I personally do not have a great deal of love for the royal family. I think they serve a purpose, but she adored Princess Diana. So one of the things she left for me was this. And she knows that I don't really like the royal family. She had a tremendous sense of humour. And she was like, OK, well, this is for you now, Kira. And I'm like... Okay, mom, I don't really know. Okay, but you've given it to me, so I'm going to kind of, I'm going to use that. But it comes most places with me, and it makes me smile, and it reminds me that actually kind of, we've got to have a sense of humor in life, you know, yeah. and you kind of, you've got to find the joy in what we do. And those little moments, and it's, there's a little bit of wickedness attached to that, yeah. but that wickedness is, is beautiful. So she has a huge impact for sure. And certainly, I guess when it comes to self awareness, I've not always been the most self aware person in the world. I have had moments where I was an absolute raging egomaniac who thought I was dominating the world. And I'd done bugger all by this point, to be fair. Mm. I'd won a couple of awards and done all right, but craziness. And I guess that's again, that's where my wife kind of comes into play. Super smart woman, absolutely puts me to shame every day of the week. She's studying her second master's degree right now. Woman loves to study. I left school with five GCSEs. So we have very different ends of the scale. But again, she influences me in a big way and she kind of she helps me to understand kind of what is important and, and that self-awareness. And when I am, in fact, being a bit of a dick, then she will tell me I'm being a bit of a dick. Yeah, so you, the, need, you need these people around oh, you. We absolutely do. We all, we all sometimes turn in to become a bit of a dick, as you call it. It's easily done. Yeah. So family is key. But then I look and kind of I look at the wider picture and I think so. Adam Grant, I love his writing. I think yeah. he's very, very smart. Look at his work around procrastination really kind of cheered me up because I'm a bit of a procrastinator. It's always been one of those things that I've kind of I beat myself up for mm. reading his work and making me realise actually there's a sweet spot of procrastination and you've got to recognise when that sweet spot comes. And live with it and tune out. And then Absolutely. You, it's about finding your uh, top points of productivity. I think it's a book called Deep Work as well. Yeah. I can't remember the author right now, but I was quite, you know, uh, because I felt sometimes guilty because my energy levels went down, but I have some like, natural points where I need to withdraw and I need to accept that because or else my impact is not going to be big over a long time. Absolutely. It's, it's just going to be average. So it's again... Uh, Did you wake right. up to do average today, Michael? I was very excited about it today because I'm going to meet one of the, the people I really admire in the industry, which is you. So every morning I said it's a new day and just take you know how I wake up in the morning. I uh, say that you decide yourself every morning. Yes. What what day it's going to be. And uh, I don't guess there's, there's days where hardship is thrown on you, but it's how you deal with that. And I think that many people forget to prime themselves for the day and actually start every day. So I do my little meditation thing mm -hmm. to find my energy. And I, I guess you have your, your thing you do. Everybody has the different thing that works for them. Uh, for me, it's meditation, 10 minutes, and then I'm in there. And then it's music on the way. Music mm -hmm. is a very big part of energizing me. And it's actually just music that comes from my when I was younger and were in restaurants. And that was the music we listened to when we closed the restaurant. Restaurant. Yeah, absolutely. I have the same playlist still, and uh, it still works. You know, it gets you in that. You no, know, I'm going to go and and do something. And it takes you back to that kind of yeah. that moment when you yeah. were kind of closing down a restaurant. That's one of those key moments where you are really in it with your guys and with your team mm. because you've got that shared goal, very clearly defined shared goal. Yeah. Kind of, we want to get this done. Purpose. We want to get it. To, absolutely, yeah. it's an amazing thing. It's a really simple example of yeah. like what that purpose do and what that common purpose can do. And music will take you right back to that. I'm with you. Music is key to me. If I'm kind of walking into a session, if I'm walking into meeting, so this morning. Morning, as you walk down the hill and kind of tap me on the shoulder in my headphones I've got a track called get up and get out it's outrageous and it's I do believe things happen for a reason so I was watching dear white people on Netflix and I was having a day last week actually last Wednesday I was having a day where I just missed my mum a lot to be fair and I'd, earlier that day I'd kind of sat in the car for an hour and not been able to move I just I was kind of frozen and I was really struggling that day and I was kind of watching dear white people and the, the outro they changed that as kind of the outro every single week I didn't know that which I like you know and it kind of ties back to something in the episode which I also quite Quite like but this song it's profanity laden in it and so i'm not going to repeat it but it really is but it basically just talks about you are it you are as good as you need to be yeah. you just need to put your back into it you need to put your grind into it and you need to get on with it i think you need to own it I exactly you need to own it. Of course, it's not like, as you said, there will be bad days, but I think it's all about how you grab them. We come back to leadership, and uh, I normally say that I understand that you're not only a leader, 
You're also a, a family person. You also brought a sister, maybe. You may also maybe a child. Mm -hmm. You may be also doing something voluntary. You are having all these roles you need to fulfill, and therefore the most important thing you need to find out is that how do I find energy to do these things? Because it's not money, it's not time, it's energy. Productivity is all about energy. How it can is. you gain more energy? I think I came to a point where I started looking at my also running my own business and started looking at it almost as a job, and that's where it starts to go wrong because you need to see it as a life. And you need to find out that yeah, you will work more than the average person. But if you, as long as you said before, are happy in what you do, but it, it demands a lot of self-discipline and, and trying different things. And actually, I sometimes have changed practices as well because I sometimes have done something for a long time. I hadn't done the music for a long time. That's something I come back to the mm -hmm. last couple of months. I don't know why. And it just taking me back to the, the restaurant. Yep where I, uh, there's one of the biggest beautiful moments and talk about that it's not about me and this podcast but I can still remember when I left my last GM role and they, the people in there they didn't buy me any fancy watches and they had made a collage of picture of them of happy moments that happened the last three years that we had together and parties and stuff like that and I was in the middle of that and they all said we love you Michael I can still remember that moment I didn't expect that and then you know I didn't know exactly what I'd done but I know I'd done something Yeah, yeah. besides running some good business role I'd done something you made an impact yeah i made an impact and then like my biggest fear the rest of my time in that business was i became director of people and operation afterward was actually it was very difficult to fulfill that talking about that transition yeah because suddenly you're managing to other people selling your philosophy to mm -hmm. other people is very difficult so yeah but these small moments where you just have to think back to them and sometimes every morning think back to some point where you really successful really felt that you were in a special place that carries you through it really does good question you started you opened a, a can of worms there almost yes <laughs> that is, I think we all feel it to be fair I yeah. think we all feel that yeah in the end of the podcast unfortunately we have to stop at some point Karen but <laughs> that's so much we need to do another podcast in the end of the podcast I always uh, ask the guest to give one advice to people out there could be in the industry or people tuning in I actually find out there's people outside the industry tuning into this and reaching out and say they learn so a lot of from, from the industry and said I'm not surprised you know it's life skills hospitality is life skills that's what you need to get through life you know mm -hmm. what would you advise to be to the community out there the mavericks out there say yes yeah say yes as much as you can do not be afraid to kind of go out there do not be afraid to put yourself out there yeah do not be uncomfortable with the fact that at some point somebody else is going to say no to you yeah that's be ready for that mm. but just say yes as much as you can and i think this year that that has been key for us you know, and I, I look at kind of exp 101 it's been driven by saying yes driven mm. by that and having conversations if somebody says have you got time for a chat yes make time for a chat do you want time for a coffee yes make time for a coffee you don't know where it's going to go you don't know what it's going to do and don't look for what it's going to deliver for you today or tomorrow think about just the bigger picture and just think what is that what is that moment going to do for me so on Tuesday night I was speaking at an event and I met a lady who has a, a vegan uh, yarn business she makes beautiful jumpers and we were chatting away about her business she was almost apologetic about the fact that she had a website and that she was trying to sell these jumpers I said what are you doing why, why are you apologising to me this I'm looking at your website now your jumpers are amazing what are you doing mm. you, you seem uncomfortable with this and she's like I don't know and I just feel really weird and I was like let's talk let's have a cup of coffee and I, I know nothing about the vegan yarn business let's be clear but I know about saying yes and I know about kind of looking and recognising actually I've got something that's worthwhile and something that makes a really positive difference so I can spend some time and there's nothing in that for me she might give me a scarf I don't know she seems sweet but I don't care that's not what it it's, for me, it's about looking and saying, how can I help you move forward? So yes, say yes as much as you can. And don't be that person who says, my time is valuable, my time is this. You know, I don't make time. I don't have time for an hour for this. I don't have time for an hour for that. Of course you do. We all do. You know, time management, you said it before, it's 24 hours in a day. You manage your choices. It's energy. Yeah. So make good choices. And you're not you lack of that? time, you're lack of energy. That was a very good uh, advice. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Watts, Kieran, for coming all the way down here and do the podcast. It's entirely my pleasure. And now we're going to go out and, and look at a, a bit of some food as well. Yes, we are. Yeah, that's going to be exciting. I'm sure there's another podcast coming up soon. But again, once again, thank you so much. Uh, very great conversation. Really enjoyed it. Me too. It's been an absolute pleasure. That's all we have time for today. Thank you to Boy Bailey Speaks for sharing your thoughts and approaches with us on how to improve your customer experience through better leadership. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please give us a like, review, share, or even better, let us know what you think. Thanks to Let's Talk Video Production for your ongoing podcast assistance. We hope you enjoyed today's Hospitality Maverick podcast with me, Michael Tinkser. Tune in next time for another industry interview. And in the meantime, find out more about us 
and sign up to a newsletter at hospitalitymaverick.com. Thanks for listening and be maverick. Maverick.